Man, it's warm up here. Wow, okay. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with um, Brother Tom, and uh, I, I think I've preached here a couple times before, and so um, you may recognize me, you may not. It's a pleasure to be here with Greg. Greg and I spent a lot of time together uh, during VBS week and children's church, and so it's, it's nice to see Greg sort of serious, um, and so that's good, and, um, but anyways, it is, it is a pleasure to be here this morning, and it is a week after Easter, and so we're going to look at a story that happens the week after Easter in John chapter 20, uh, beginning in verse 24. As we celebrated last week, Jesus is risen from the dead, and Jesus appears the night of his resurrection to ten of the disciples. Judas is, of course, gone at this point, and Thomas, for whatever reason, is not there when Jesus appears. And so that's where we pick, pick the story up in John chapter 20, beginning in verse 24. As I prepare to read the word, I would ask you to stand, if you're able, as we turn our attention to God's word. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Father God, I do ask this morning that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your word. Lord, that as I preach, my words would be quickly forgotten, but that your word would penetrate our hearts Father, by your Holy Spirit, would challenge us, convict us, encourage us, and transform us by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I would say that in today's world, we live in a skeptical age, an age marked by skepticism. And one uh, example of this is seen in the movie Moana. So I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. I've seen Moana many times. And, uh, and in Moana, uh, the, it begins with a song called Where You Are. And in that song, Moana's grandmother says to Moana, you may hear a voice inside, and if the voice starts to whisper, to follow the farthest star, Moana, that voice inside is who you are. It's inspirational uh, to say that our inner voice is who we are. Our feelings can define us. But obviously that's also marked with a bit of skepticism, isn't it? Because the question starts to become, what's true? Who gets to define what's true in our world? And we would say in today's world, the authority is given to the self, to the individual, that you get to define what's true, listening to your inner voice. And that makes us automatically skeptical of anything else. But this skepticism is not new, although it might be magnified in today's world, because the human heart has always been prone to spiritual doubt, to skepticism. If we go all the way back to the beginning, Adam and Eve, their first sin is born in doubt. Did God really say that? And they start to think, is God really looking out for me? Does God really want what's best for me? Maybe this fruit is what I really need. And of course, since then, the seed has been sown in the human heart of doubt. This seed sown that we know better. That we question God's sovereignty. 
We question God's providence. We even question God's presence with us. And so in today's world, when you mix together a skeptical age and the human heart's propensity to doubt, it's a nasty cocktail, or maybe we should say a smoothie in this setting, a smoothie of of skepticism, where any truth from the outside we look at and we think, nah, I don't really want that. I don't really believe that. And of course, that creates a massive problem. Because if anything is true, if anything is truly true, it has to be transcendent. It has to come from outside of ourselves. And so we have a lot of young Christians in the church today. As a youth pastor, I can see it, and working with college students as well, a lot of young Christians struggling with doubt. But let's not just point the finger at the young either, because we know we all can struggle. And it's not just a problem uh, in the church, it's a problem for everyone. And the hope, though, in the church, as we gather together, as we look at God's word, the hope is in the midst of difficult questions and struggles and doubts, the Bible says you are not alone. You're not alone. As I've already said, there's others. You can look to your left and look to your right And if anyone says, I've never had a single question unanswered about Christianity. I've never doubted anything in the Bible. They're probably lying. You're not alone. But more important than just others is the fact that God, God is with you. God does not abandon you. God doesn't shy away from our doubts and our struggles. The Bible is full of stories of people questioning God, yelling at God, Doubting God's goodness. And yet, we also see in the Bible that God proves himself. That God's truth always prevails. And that's what we see this morning in the story of Doubting Thomas. When Doubting Thomas becomes Faithful Thomas. And so we see Thomas work through this process of three steps. There's the doubt of Thomas, the call of Jesus... And then the faith of Thomas. The doubt, the call, and the faith. And so as we read this morning, we see that Thomas has missed the boat. Thomas has missed perhaps the greatest occurrence in the history of the world. Talk about FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Imagine going to the moon in 1969, falling asleep, and waking up on the way back to Earth and saying, what? Why didn't you wake me up? I missed it. Well, Thomas has missed out on the resurrection of Christ, and he makes a strong statement. Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and I place my finger and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. I will never believe. That statement is actually even stronger than it's translated in English. It's, it's, a, it's an emphatic negative. Until pigs fly, I will never believe that this has happened. Thomas wants evidence. Not just evidence from the disciples, but personal evidence. Unless I do it, unless my hand goes into his side. Thomas wants evidence that the resurrection has really happened. Of course, We can hear a hint of this. Jesus let me down once. I'm not going to let him let me down again. Let me down once, uh, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, right? And, um, And so Thomas does not want to believe until he has evidence. There's a guy named uh, Sam Harris, and he's a leading, a leader in the in the new atheist movement. And Sam Harris says that Christians base their belief on no evidence whatsoever. No evidence whatsoever. And that is a patently false statement. I mean, it's completely false. Books and books have been written about the evidence uh, of the Bible and the truth of Scripture. Um, There's evidence all over. Archaeological evidence, historical evidence, scientific evidence, non-Christian writings at the time which confirm what the Bible says that Christianity is actually well-reasoned, 
And there's lots of evidence for it. And so let me um, give you an example, an example of that. And that is the resurrection of Christ. Thomas's doubt is that did Jesus rise again from the dead? So is there evidence for the resurrection? Now, this is not exhaustive, but let me just give three quick points to, pr- to sort of prove the point that there is evidence. The first is, did Jesus rise again from the dead? The first is that there's an empty tomb, okay? There's an empty tomb. And so as people claim that Jesus rose from the dead, well, let's just put it this way. If you claim someone rose from the dead and it was such a big spectacle, we would probably go and look and see, is there still a body there, right? That no one could produce a body from this tomb in which Jesus was laid. The tomb was empty, and no one, even Roman and Jewish sources, discounted the fact that the tomb was empty. A second point of evidence is that the disciples, specifically even in Acts 2, Peter, goes and starts to preach that Jesus rose from the dead. And he preaches that message in Jerusalem, the city where Jesus was crucified. So once again, he's preaching that Jesus rose from the dead right there. He didn't come to Allenwood, New Jersey or Cherry Hill, somewhere really far away. Um, But he preached right there in Jerusalem that this Jesus rose from the dead. And I think another piece of evidence for the resurrection is that these men, these fishermen, tax collector, and others, that um, at one point after the resurrection are locked in a room for fear, for fear of what's going to happen to them, they go out after the resurrection of Christ, and all of them, besides one, become martyrs for their faith, die preaching that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, we know that people will hold to a lie, We know that people will hold to a lie, even to the point of death, when it benefits them in some way, when they have something to gain from the lie. We can understand that. I can understand that. I have a five-year-old, right? He can hold to a lie when, when he's benefiting from it. But none of them benefited anything besides persecution and hardship and death, and yet not a single one recanted from their preaching. And so, again, this isn't exhaustive but evidence that the resurrection really happened. That Christianity is the story of good news. The gospel is good news. And news is reported, as we know, reported about things that happen in real time and space. This is not just a worldview or an inspiration, but it's a faith based on real events. And it's not blind faith. It's not blind faith. Thomas, though, the problem here is that what happens when the evidence runs dry? What happens when evidence only gets us so far in believing the gospel? Thomas demands, demands a sign, demands something from Christ. Jesus in John 4, verse 48, already sort of condemned this attitude Jesus says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. A.W. Pink is a Christian writer, and he says that Thomas presumes to describe the conditions which must be met before he is ready to believe. The the, The problem is not that Thomas wants evidence, but that he demands something before he will believe. It sounds like this. Unless blank, I will never believe. Unless I can touch Jesus, I will never believe. What is it for us? What's our criteria? Unless I hear an audible voice, I will never believe. Unless God heals my sick child, I will never believe. Unless I get what I want in my way, I will never believe. Or maybe we can flip it the other way. Until, until I have to change the way I live, I'll believe while it's convenient. Until I disagree with God or God's word, 
I'll believe. But once there's a disagreement or a contradiction, my way is going to win. We create our own criteria for faith. And then when our criteria isn't met, we start to doubt God's goodness, God's presence, and God's grace. I heard it put this way. We turn Jesus into a trivial pursuit Jesus. If you've ever played trivial pursuit, you know the little pie with the little slices. Jesus might be one slice of the pie, but he's not the whole thing. We try to make God into our image instead of remembering that we were made in the image of God. And so Thomas shows here his doubt. But next we see the call of Jesus. Jesus shows up. Although the doors are locked, Jesus shows up. And Jesus repeats, essentially repeats Thomas's words back to him. Now, if you said something like, unless I see Jesus, I'll never believe, and Jesus comes and, uh, Jesus comes and says, all right, Thomas, come put your hands here. I would feel a little bit um, sort of like a dog with my tail between my legs, right? A little bit like, oh, uh, I'm getting called out. Jesus here, though, of course, shows his patience and his mercy. He doesn't rebuke Thomas. He doesn't yell at Thomas, but he gives Thomas what he wants. Come and see for yourself. Come and put your finger here. See my hands. Place out your hand. Place it in my side. Jesus calls Thomas to come and see, to examine his doubts against the truth. Essentially what he's saying is, come to me. Come look. And we see the ultimate call of Jesus in verse 27. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And that, um, the way that it's written, it reads more like this. Do not be disbelieving, but believing. Now, that's a little choppy in English. But the sense is, do not be a disbelieving person, but a believing person. Do not be a person marked by unbelief, but by belief. Jesus' point is not that if you ever have any doubt or any question, that you are not a believer. That's not the point. Jesus is saying, be a person of belief. Walk by faith and not by sight. When your sight is telling you one thing and your faith is saying something else, walk by faith. My dad uh, was exploring Christianity and asking lots of questions in college, and he had a, a mentor and a friend who worked with him and talked with him a lot about the gospel. My dad is a lawyer, sort of has an analytical mind, had a lot of questions he wanted answered. And um, so one day he comes after, after a while and says, hey, can you tell me more about Jesus? And my dad's friend says, no. I'm like, wait, what? Isn't that like your job description as a Christian, right, to tell me? And my, my dad's friend said, no, I've told you everything you need to know. You will always have more questions. Every question will not be perfectly answered, but you know what you need to know. Will you believe or not? Do you believe it or not? And my dad, at that point, gave his life to Christ. Um, it was a bold move, of course, but um, one that I'm thankful for as, uh, as I was brought up by a father that trusts in Jesus. And so Jesus calls us all, calls us all, to bring our questions to him. These meta questions, I like to call them. These meta questions of life. Where do we come from? What's our purpose? Where can we find lasting joy? Why is there pain and suffering in the world? Jesus calls us to bring those questions to God's word. The God's word speaks to all of those things. We might not always like the answer, we might not always get the perfect answer, but where else can we say that these questions are answered and we can find truth? God proves his truth and his word. Because God is God and we are not, in fact, I had a seminary professor that used to make us say in class, he would make us repeat after him, I am not the Christ. So we'd have to say, I am not the Christ, right? It sounds silly, 
but God is God and we are not. And because of that simple fact, there will be times when we do not understand what's going on in our lives and in our world. Because God is God and we are not, there are going to be times when we would say, I would have done things differently. If I was God, I would have done things differently. But we're not. And Tim Keller says that if your God never contradicts you or disagrees with you, then you're just worshiping an idealized version of yourself. What he means is, if God is just always agreeing with you, you're just worshiping yourself. We will struggle with questions and doubts, but we're called to faith. Hebrews 12, verse 2, tells us to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Look to Jesus. Jesus calls us to him. And the truth is, the dangerous truth about doubt is that doubt is directional. That doubt causes movement. What I mean by that, well, here's an example, here's an illustration. I uh, was flying to St. Louis once for a wedding, and my friend and I were sitting in the airport flying standby. I don't know if anyone's ever done that, but you wait for an open seat. So we're waiting for two open seats. So we got to the airport at 6 a.m., and we waited all day until 5 p.m. We never got on a flight. And needless to say, we had some doubt in our minds that we would ever get on a flight. And doubt causes movement. We said, all right, forget this. We are getting in the car, driving through the night from Virginia to St. Louis. And we made it dreary-eyed, but we made it safely by God's grace. Doubt causes movement. And spiritual doubt causes us to move either towards faith or unbelief. If our doubts take deep root, they're like weeds that choke out our faith. And so the Bible calls us to combat our doubt, to combat our doubt. How do we do that? How do we fight back against doubts and unanswered questions? In fact, fighting back against doubt can strengthen our faith, the Bible says. Well, the first thing I've already said is to look to the source, to look to God's word. That I, and I'm sure you, spend a lot of time listening to other voices, to what other people say, believing what I hear in the news, believing what I read online, believing what I hear even from well-meaning people and pastors, but not looking to the ultimate source. If we have a question and a doubt, we should always look back to the source of God's word. Don't believe what you hear from others if it contradicts the word of God. The second important thing is to have trusted voices around you. I can't tell you how many times I've seen my own friends and peers who start to question things and surround themselves with people that don't have the same worldview and faith and go down a dangerous path. They surround themselves with people that say the things that they want to hear, and it just supports them in their leaving and straying from God. And so we should surround ourselves with trusted voices, whether it be parents, pastors, Sunday school teachers, friends. We need others to speak into our lives because while we may be struggling with doubt, others can strengthen us and vice versa. We should always be a trusted voice to others as well. We should always treat others in their doubt. And parents, listen, this is important because I've also seen this. When kids and teenagers start to struggle with Christianity, one of the most dangerous things that can happen is the shame and the guilt and the rebuking and not the compassion that Jesus shows here. The compassion that Jesus shows to Thomas. And lastly, we should certainly pray. When all else fails, we pray for greater assurance. We pray even when maybe we don't believe that it will be answered. Maybe we feel like we've prayed for years. God, give me greater assurance of my faith. And it might be some piece of evidence, but more likely it's just the circumstances in our lives. That some way God works 
Some way God proves himself. And so we pray for that. The point is we have to fight back against doubt. And in doing that, the Bible says that our faith can be strengthened. And so we turn then at the end to the faith of Thomas. Thomas has shown his doubt. Jesus has called him. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas shows his faith. He answers with one of the greatest confessions of faith in all of Scripture in verse 28. My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Now, some people will ask, yeah, but is it real? I would say the same thing if Jesus showed up through a locked door. Why doesn't Jesus do that for me? In fact, Jesus says, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Is Jesus taking a shot at Thomas? Well, I tend to think no. I'm sort of an optimist, but I don't think so. What's the end game here? What's Jesus' desire? Jesus says, repent and believe, right? Turn to me in faith. And Thomas has done that. Thomas has done that. But Jesus knows not everyone will have the same opportunity to touch his hands and his side, to see him with our eyes, our physical eyes. Some people say you only believe because your parents believed. You only believe because God saved you from that car accident. You only believe because you're poor and uneducated. But I say to that, of course, yes. Okay. Praise God. Praise God for aligning the circumstances in my life that I had parents of faith that brought me up in the church. Would Drew Grigg believe in Jesus if he wasn't raised by Christian parents? I have no idea. In fact, I don't really want to know. Who cares how we get there? The truth is God chose and called us to himself through whatever circumstances. Does that make my faith weaker or less genuine? And if anything, it's amazing to see and amazing to hear the testimonies as a pastor, um, I'm sure Pastor Tom would agree to hear the di diverse ways that people come to Jesus. What a testimony it is. And some people will say, and some of you teenagers, I'm talking to you because I was right where you are, my testimony is not very exciting, right? You, it's really exciting when people stand up and say, I was addicted to drugs, I was, I was passed out in a ditch, and God, like, that's amazing. But does it make it more exciting? Remember the story that Jesus tells, that the shepherd left 99 sheep to find one. And that one is you. And how exciting is that, that Jesus would seek you and call you and choose you as his own. And so we should celebrate our faith no matter how we get there. And as I alluded to earlier, Thomas, however he came to faith, all right, Jesus is not condoning his demanding of a sign, but Jesus gives Thomas, graciously gives him what he desires. Thomas turns to Christ in faith, and Thomas dies as a martyr, preaching the gospel, most believe, all the way to India. And so was his faith weaker or less genuine? Of course not. Of course not. So what we see is that John ends the body of his gospel with this story. There is another chapter, which is sort of like an appendix, but John essentially ends his gospel telling the story of Thomas. Of all the stories, why would you end with doubting Thomas? Well, John ends his gospel with a challenge to us, with an example to us. Jesus says it, have you believed because you have not seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We will not, most likely, see Jesus walk through this door and be able to touch his side. John ends with the story of Thomas as a challenge to us. Will you believe it or not? Will you believe it or not? Will you believe the testimony of Scripture? 
In fact, John says, just after this, he continues, he says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Will you believe the testimony? Thomas had ten disciples show up and tell him, Jesus is risen from the dead. And Thomas says, I don't believe it. And we have disciples. We have the apostles. We have scripture written for us, telling us, Jesus is risen from the dead, our Lord and our God. Will we believe it? This is not a fantasy. It's not a belief system invented by humans. It's the story of Christ that happened in real time and space. And if it happened the way that it's written, it is life-changing and world-changing. It's the greatest story ever told. And so whether you believe it or not, I would certainly challenge you to answer that question. Don't sit there on the fence, because this is life-changing and world-changing. I like to think of life as a bit like a, a Tough Mudder race. If you've never heard of a Tough Mudder, it's basically, there's a lot of different varieties. But think about a 10-mile running race with all these obstacles, right? As if 10 mile, running 10 miles isn't torture enough and hard enough. They put walls in the way and mud pits, and some even have, like, electric shocks. Like, what crazy people would do that, right? Life is like a tough mutter. Hebrews 12, verse 1, tells us to run the race with endurance. Endurance, that life hits us hard sometimes. And you will, you will find yourself in a mud pit at some point, stuck in the mud. You will have cause to doubt God's goodness. You will have cause to question the circumstances in your life, even to doubt, is God really even there? Read the Psalms. How long, O Lord, will you forget me? Will you hide your face from me forever? Maybe that's you right now. And when we're stuck in the mud, when we're hit by electric shocks, the mark of spirituality, the mark of a true Christian, is not that your life is obstacle-free. Sometimes we start to believe that, right? Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm not praying hard enough. Maybe my faith isn't real enough because these things keep happening in my life. The mark of spirituality is not that your life is obstacle-free, but that as we get hit by mud, we keep moving forward with our eyes fixed on Christ, walking by faith and not by sight. And it's when we're stuck in the mud that it's most important to remember that our relationship with God is not dependent on the strength of our faith, but the object of our faith. Let me say that again. Your identity in Christ, being saved by God's grace, is not dependent on the strength of your faith but the object of your faith, who we place our faith in, the resurrected Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John says that we have life in his name, not your name, not my name. Jesus shows us, even in the story of Thomas, he doesn't wait for our faith to improve. He doesn't throw us to the curb whenever we struggle or doubt. There's not some standard of faith that we have to stay above or we get kicked out, kicked off the team. Jesus says, look here, look here. Don't look left, don't look right, don't look up, don't look down. Fix your eyes on me. And in those moments, may our prayer be that of the Father in Mark chapter 9 looking to have his child healed, he comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I believe in whatever feeble, imperfect way. 
Lord, I question, I doubt, I struggle. I want things to happen differently, but I still believe. Help my unbelief. Do you believe it or not? Let's pray. Father God, we are thankful for this story of Thomas. What an amazing truth that your word gives us. In fact, the apostles write out their own struggles, their own failures, their own doubts. What a testimony to us today in 2021 to see that even those closest to you, closest to Christ during his time on earth, still had doubts. And Father, if we're honest, we do too. And so I do pray, Lord, that you would strengthen our faith, that we would fix our eyes on you to walk by faith and not by sight, that you would remind us of your grace and forgiveness because we are prone to wander. We're stuck in the mud. We try to drag ourselves out. We blame others. We blame you. Forgive us for that, Father. Humble us. Cause us to turn to you. And I pray especially this morning, especially for those youth, college students, anyone here that's really, really struggling, that's really questioning, either coming to you for the first time or have been a Christian for a long time and are starting to think, is this even real? And Father, I pray especially this morning that your Holy Spirit would grant them assurance, that you would wash over us grace upon grace with your truth. Father, we're thankful for Christ. We're thankful for his death and resurrection, that we may have life in his name, and even today, even today, that we may be forgiven, and Jesus is calling us to come. We pray these things in his name. Amen.